Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. Warmest welcome to you one more time this morning. Thanks for gathering to worship God um, from wherever you're coming from. You know, you might be just here. You might have moved in this weekend. You might be from here, and this is like your 30th year to be in New York City, and you're surrounded by newcomers, you know. Um, you might just be in visiting for the weekend. Wherever you're coming from, you're invited as we look towards, um, we look towards God together, and we let him draw us upward, and as we get closer to him, we get closer to each other. That's just the way it works to worship and uh, so we're glad, really glad that you're a part of it. My name is Garrett. If we didn't meet you or I didn't catch you on your way in. And uh, I'm just so glad that you, uh, that you made it to be here this morning. Um, sometimes I get asked, I was a move-in. Um, you can probably tell I don't have like a convincing New Yorker accent. So you already knew I was a move-in the second you saw me. But when I moved here, um, people started to ask me, both from here and from elsewhere, the same question. And I still get asked it sometimes, which is this. What surprised you most when you moved to New York City? What surprised you most? Because you're in for a surprise one way or another. There's no way to fully anticipate. You just got to get in it to, you know, to get in it, you know. So you just have to uh, count on some surprises. So I get asked that sometimes. And uh, there are a few things, but this is uh, one of the highest ones up there. And uh, it no longer surprises me, but it did when I first got here. And that was this fact about New York City. We are a deeply religious city. We are a deeply religious city. People don't know that about New York outside of New York City. If you're from here, you, you know it, you assume it, because everywhere you walk on every block, there's a house of worship of some kind. I mean, there are churches everywhere. In fact, when we started, uh, when we started Mission City, and you know, people would ask, you know, why did you move here, or, or what is this, and all this, we would tell them, you know, well, we're starting a church. And you know what people would say who are from here? They would say, another one? Because we're a deeply religious city. There are a lot of houses of worship um, in this city. Brooklyn is sometimes called the borough of churches, but it's all across New York City. It's a, you can walk through the Manhattan. And these are not just museums, by the way. These are active, these are active standing uh, houses of worship of many different kinds. So we are a deep, deeply religious city. And I think what probably gets amplified is and, and exaggerated is like the secular impulse that's in New York City. And make no mistake about it, there is a strong secular section and undertow of certain parts of New York City. There's no getting around that. I'm not trying to obscure that. Um, but I think it's overdone. You know, one person said you can't go more than a block without finding a house of worship in New York City. I agree with that. Um, one person who is an, a professor of theology here in town says people sort of associate New York with complete secularism. And I don't think that's really true. And I don't either. Um, another person says it this way. New York City has long had an undeserved reputation for being godless Gotham. But the truth, as most New Yorkers know, is that the city runs on faith as much or more than most other metropolises. And I believe that that's true as well. And you go, okay, well, how about numbers? Numbers, numbers. Okay, well, how about the numbers? 25%, um, this comes from um, uh, NY1 uh, Public Religion Research Institute, that 25%, only 25% of New Yorkers claim zero religious group. Like, I'm unaffiliated, I don't have a religious group, I'm not into religion, I don't have an identity, I do not identify, I'm nothing, okay? So that's 25% of New Yorkers who say that, which, I mean, that's two million people. That's a lot of people, fair and square, who are saying, I don't have any religion, I don't have a faith, I don't belong to any group. Two million people is a lot. But let's consider from the other perspective. That means six million people, 75% do have a religious group. That's a lot of people. So at three out of every four New Yorkers would say, I belong to some kind of religious group. 75%. That's an overwhelming majority. That is a deeply religious city. Now, diversity all over the place. No question about that as to what religion we're talking about and how it runs and what it's focused on and all this. So religious diversity is baked in there. But religiousness itself is very much in the water for New York City. 75% of people would say, I belong to some group. Now, I'm not saying they all go to church. I mean, you saw those empty sidewalks when you came, you know, on Sunday morning uh, that you just walked through, okay? So I'm not saying 75% of New York City, uh, you know, is, is active necessarily, but it's significant that 75% of New York City would just say, I have a group that I belong to. It proves that religion has a great hold on this city that sometimes is over-exaggerated and promote it as the capital of secularism. And I'm telling you, New York City is no capital of secularism. I found that out very quick. It is a religious hotbed. But what, part of what comes with that is that there are many 
confusing and conflicting viewpoints, many challenges that come with that. So I would say not only are we a deeply religious city, I would argue that we are also a religiously confused city. And when I say confused here, I don't mean every individual consider themselves confused. I mean that um, the overall religious dialogue and, and worldview variety is challenging and at times confusing. I mean, no matter what your worldview is, Christian or otherwise, no matter what worldview you're coming from, there's a good chance you could move to this city and bump up against a new idea and find yourself confused. That's part of it. No matter where you're coming from, no matter what worldview you're coming from, you could be coming from an irreligious background and then come here to a church and be challenged by a Christian idea. I mean, you can be coming from anywhere, going to anywhere and find yourself religiously confused because you wound up, after all, in a deeply religious but confused and conflicted place. And so to prove this point um, that we're religiously confused, um, I would like to turn not to statistics, not to quotes, not to theology professors, but just to the good old comment section of Mission City Church's Instagram. All right, so we're going to go to, wait, if we could just wait, if we could just wait, hold on, uh, I just got to intro this just for a second. Um, this, what you're about to see is a top 10 of um, comments, not all, just the top 10, and uh, not from all history ever, from our last video. Okay, so um, just so you're clear, um, we engage online because we say our mission is to connect people with God and with each other. Well, it just so happens that New Yorkers are much more connective with their phone, modern people everywhere, much more connective with their phone than they are a stranger on the sidewalk. So we have decided to engage Instagram with advertising. And um, that, in fact, that probably resulted in a good handful. If you'd be so, we don't normally do this to our first time guests, this is unusual, but just, just so you could show, could you slip your hand in the air if you like came here because of Instagram at any point, and that's what brought you? Wow, okay, so you are the reason why we engage on Instagram. What you're about to see is not the reason we engage on Instagram necessarily, okay? Some of this is comedic, some of it's serious. I'm not hating on anybody. We removed their personal details, to be clear. Um, but um, let the games begin. Um, number one of the top 10. This person says, I'm thinking of going, it seems like so many good people and good energy. I've been down, I've been so down lately and this popped up. And you go, this is why we do this. I mean, that somebody would put that that's we want to reach out to people who are alone with nothing but their phone and for them to know God sees them. So you think, this is going well, but hang in there because there's more. Um, someone says, no thanks, Satan all the way. And then the next person says, how? Um, as if, you know, I, I don't know. And, and then the next person says, the person, and then we've got the helpful interpreter. You know the interpreter? The person saying they prefer Satan over this organization. Okay, so now they, we have clarified that. Okay, great. Let us, let us move on. That number, if you don't do baptisms, you're not a real church. Now, that's helpful. Um, I actually find that to be, here's what's crazy. I agree with that. Baptizing is part of church. If you need to get baptized, we need to baptize you. That's part of church life. So if you've never been baptized, I'm going to be standing here right here at the end. You, some of you are waiting for the punchline of this joke. Not a joke. If you want to be baptized, I would love to discuss this with you. Okay, anyway, so this person, random, agreed. Um, but true anyway. Okay, so let's move forward. Wasn't planning on being Christian, and this ad cemented that for me. Thanks, prayer hands, or high five. And then one person says, LOL, and two people put their amen to that. So anyway, all right. Next one. I, this person is very sincere. This person's going deep uh, and was kind about it. Um, they say, I don't think God has called for humans to be with the opposite sex. Our post wasn't about sex, to be clear, but this was the thing that they wanted to speak on. I don't think God has called for humans to be with the opposite sex. I believe that was made up by humans. It's a belief that formed from man's interpretation. I think Christians shouldn't try to classify sexuality as a sin. My belief is that it's all made up. There is more proof. So, so in other words, human sexuality, all of it is just like a pure construct. It's all arbitrary. That's the viewpoint that's being asserted here. But then there's a real move here. There is more proof that aliens exist than there is proof that what was written in the Bible is actually from God. All right, so there's a whole nother perspective coming in. All right, next one. God must really be on me. I think that's supposed to be me. God must really be on me because stuff like this would never come on my timeline when I wasn't trying to get out of my ways. Wow, there's power in that. So that's another one where you're like, okay, all that other was worth it. Like we're reaching out to people who are trying to change their ways, you know, and we're trying to reach out to people. Okay, but we're moving forward. How, are, oh, this one, here comes the Christian critic. All right, I'm gonna clap back on this one. I just can't help myself. All right, how are all these churches popping up out of nowhere? We grinded for like four years, people. Like we didn't pop up out of nowhere. We did apartment, we just, there was a guy standing up here saying, we used to do it in his house with eight people during the pandemic. 
It wasn't fun, okay? Like, we didn't ever know we were going to get to this point, okay? But anyway, so, but we just popped up out of nowhere with a whole worship team. Let me tell you how that happens. You find people who can sing, you put them up here. Okay, marketing and community. I go to some other church with like 30 members as an array of all ages. That sounds good. All array of all ages sounds good. I wish we had more older and younger people here. I won't lie. But nothing like all these new churches. It's giving tickling the ear and not sound doctrine meat. There's so many metaphors in that sentence, I can't even begin to unpack. I don't know if we're doing ears or if we're doing meat. Um, but I don't know why some Christians assume that you can't promote well and teach the Bible in full. Like, I don't know why you just can't promote well and teach the Bible in full. Anyway, uh, or am I wrong? I would wager. Uh, because how do y'all have the funds? Now she wants to see the bank. Okay. How do y'all have the funds to support your ministry and already be this established? Like, we just microwaved all this out of like a... I just can't wrap, oh, 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 can't wrap my mind around it. So it's almost like the idea is that like, how, like, how can you afford this? You know what I'm saying? And so you would think, I mean, this person is a churchgoer by their own admission. So you would think like they would walk by your Instagram page and be like, hey, I hope you find a lot of people, you know, same team. But instead it's just that Christian critique thing. Okay, next. Now nah, God going to handle you mookie people, you watch. Okay, next. Um, okay, this one, genuine question. This is important. Y'all gentrifying church? And then someone um, laughs, and then someone says, stop, this ad was actually giving me hope, and now I'm here laughing. So there is no such thing as um, church unfolding without a social set of surroundings. You're aware of that, right? Like, none of us escape our social surroundings. And it just so happens that downtown Brooklyn particularly is being gentrified, often to the harm of the receiving population. So gentrification is when an entering population enters a place and the cost of said place begins to rise and rise and rise and rise until the people who have been there for generations can no longer afford to live in the place where their parents and grandparents lived, okay? So that phenomenon called gentrification has taken place and is actively taking place in downtown Brooklyn. And this person is seeing our ad and wanting to know, are you a part of that? I went back and watched the ad and I was like, we have, first off, we have native New Yorkers that are a part of our church. But for some reason, Coincidence, none of them were in the video. So when I go back and look at the video, I'm like, we don't feel like we come from here, you know? So people are asking this question. But I'll tell you this, what's the answer? The answer is, you know, when someone is gentrifying something, they're looking for a profit at the expense, they're entering, they're looking for a profit at the expense of the receiving community. That's what they're doing. They're not looking to serve, they're not looking to care, they're not looking to become one for a good and a holy purpose. And the scripture says that the opposite is true when Christians come into a place that it says in Thessalonians, we didn't come to you with a pretext for greed. That's what's wrapped up in this question. Are you here with a pretext for greed or are you here for the good of the community? I mean, do you want to give into this community or do you want to extract an experience or a wealth level from this community, right? And I would say, you know what? I can tell you for sure, not only because of the presence of native New Yorkers in this church that have helped shape our thinking on the subject, but two out of the three previous venues that we have rented, we renovated according to the style of the landlord and owner who was either the leader of a church or the leader of a school and native New Yorkers. And we asked them, what do you want the tiles to look like? Because you're going to walk on them after we're gone. What do you want these bathrooms to look like? Because you guys and your kids are going to use them after we're gone. We pay, you keep, and make it look like you want. Because we're not trying to gentrify your bathrooms or your floors or whatever. We're not trying to remake this place in our image, right? We're trying to leave it better than we found it according to your standard. We have attempted to be generous with every one of our landlords. So no, a fair question in other words, but no, we're not Ginger Frank Church. Okay, next. Is this Catholic? Someone says non-denominational. Someone says Baptist with a better website. And we have a winner right there, number, door number three. That's us, caught us. I almost got on there and was like, we have a winner. But I didn't do it because the internet is insane. And I just didn't want to go there. Okay, there's my case that we are religiously confused. Are you convinced? We are just, a, we have covered, we've got, from gentrification and social issues to human sexuality and aliens in the comments, all right? So we are a religiously confused place, I rest my case, which has to mean we're left asking the question, what even is real religion? Like you just, in a diverse viewpoint place, you've got to at some point ask, what is even real? Like what is real religion? And today as we open the New Testament together, uh, we'll see in the book of James, him actually say, what real and true and valuable religion is and what worthless religion is and help us tell the real from the fake. So all of this 
religious intensity, all of this religious diversity, has to leave you wondering, what is even real? What is even trustworthy? And the New Testament in the book of James is going to help us with that today. Uh, we've been studying the book of James, and we will continue. First off, religion is not a bad word. I want to be clear as I'm using it today. I know a lot of times we can use religion as a bad word, meaning it's just some organized system of, of humans. That's not how we're using it today. Um, sometimes we use it also as the opposite of a grace-based relationship, as if like, to, uh, to, to do religion is to try to climb your way to God when we're supposed to actually rest in the fact that Jesus has come to us in a relationship and we don't need to construct a religion. Um, that's not how we're using the word either. We're talking about how does a person connect to God and in, in in religion in a good sense of the word because the book of James is going to give that word some practicality and some content and some positivity. So here it comes. It's only two verses, not a lot of scripture today, but let's let it deeply go through us as we deeply go through it. If anyone thinks he is religious, and by the way, even if you don't, the people out there do, just because you're here, okay? Again, most people are not here today in a house of worship. So if you're here and you've got a notebook open and you're about to write something down and you're taking a note or you lift your hands in worship, you may not use the word religious to self-define, but about seven and a half million other people would, okay? So you're in there, all right? So if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, what an interesting thing, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. He could have gone any direction he wanted to go. I don't know where you thought he was going to go, but I wouldn't have gone there. That just seems like so random, so one little part of life. You know, I would have said something else. I don't know. But for the book of James, God inspiring these words, if anyone thinks he's religious but doesn't bridle his tongue, meaning you just run your mouth out of control, your religion is is worthless. It's not having an effect on you. So to bridle the tongue, literally the Greek word means to control an animal. It's like a complex compound verb where you take a bunch of parts and put it together. Literally means to control an animal by putting a piece of metal in its mouth. Literally, that's what a bridle is, okay? Um, so I don't get, being from out of town, I don't get a lot of like cultural points, but we're, talking, but we're talking about bridling here. I'm from the middle of nowhere. I rode a horse before I'd ridden a train or a plane. There's a statistic, okay? So I know what a bridle is. You literally put a piece of metal in a horse's mouth and you tell it where to go. And I remember being little and being told, don't pull hard because you're already in total control. You don't have to yank. You don't have, you're going to hurt. You, know, you don't have to do it. You can just gently steer because you are in control because there's a piece of metal in the animal's mouth, right? So James is saying, if your religion can't make you in control of your own words, your religion is worthless. Your religion is fake. It's not really real. If you can't control your own mouth on the keyboard or with your words, at that moment at least, it doesn't mean you know, entirely positionally, okay, but your religion is just not working. It is broken and it's not functioning, right? And that's a challenge for us because I don't know how you deal with certain moments, but I really, really rely on words a lot. And whenever I'm upset or not in touch with the Holy Spirit or whatever you wanna call it, my words start going. Some people get quiet when they get upset. I don't do, I've never understood you people. I don't get it. I start describing, because I feel like if I can just describe the dysfunction, it gives me some power somehow. I don't know. I will start analyzing. I will start explaining to self and others, anyone who is with earshot, exactly what is wrong in this situation. And I just start using words. And guess what? In those moments, my religion is often worthless. James wouldn't laugh at it, wouldn't call it cute, wouldn't call it funny, wouldn't call it oops, would say, hey, there's your worthless religion again because you can't control your mouth, okay? I had a doctor's appointment on Friday morning at 9.30 and I go up and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna park and I'm gonna train and I'm gonna walk. That's my offense, okay? I'm gonna park, train, walk, all right? So just city logistics. Well, couldn't find a parking spot, went to the next parking spot. Um, the app doesn't work. It's evidently the only block in the neighborhood where the app doesn't work. Okay, um, in the, go to the meter. Meter doesn't work. Okay, now I'm gonna be late for the doctor. N now, like some words are brewing. You know what I'm saying? Like my mouth is not moving, but some words are brewing. Like it's just kind of, you know. So then I go into the parking lot, up to the fourth floor. Now I'm for sure gonna be late. 
Come down the train, um, check the app, one leaves at 9.02, I run to catch it at 9.01, it drives off one minute early, making sure everybody's early but me, okay? So it leaves one minute early, and now my mouth is moving. Not vocalizing, but now my mouth is like forming words, and they were not nice words. You ever see that clip, like if you're like watching a sports game or something where like coach or player is like very upset, and you don't have the audio, you just got like the picture of their mouth moving, and you know what what they said, you know, and it's kind of like, I don't think their mother would be very proud of what's being said right now. You know what I mean? So I had one of those on Friday. I don't have them often, but I have one of those on Friday. My mouth is kind of like moving silently, not saying nice words. Do you know why that happened? Because for about 30 minutes, my religion was worthless. That's the truth. Because if you're walking with the living and true God, you're in control of your mouth. Like you're in control of your words. You're, it doesn't matter if you have a justified complaint, you're still in control. You can make a justified complaint while being in control. The question is, are you in control of your words or are your words in control of you? You ever um, let go of a few words and then realize, oh, I just did way more damage than what I meant to do. If, you're, if your faith in God and your reliance on the Holy Spirit is working, then you won't ever get in that situation. You can drive forward, you can change things, you can, you can voice frustration, there's a space for that, you can fix problems, you can tell someone else to move, please. Like you, there's all kinds of things you can do constructively with words, but if you lose your control, then you, your, your religion is not functioning properly. James goes on. But religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans goes to a whole other direction. You would have thought he was going to say the opposite. Self-controlled words. Choose your words wisely. Speak to build up others. But he goes a whole different direction. Here's what's pure and undefiled religion before God the Father. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Notice it doesn't say visit orphans and widows if they are the afflicted kind of orphans and widows. It assumes that's already the same thing. The scripture is assuming that um, for this particular context, by the way, orphans and widows had neither direct means. I'm reading now from the IVP Bible background commentary. Orphans and widows had neither direct means of support nor automatic legal defenders in that society, right? So there was no such thing as like kind of that American like bootstrapping mentality of like, well, you know, the tough get going, you know, and all this. There was no way to get going. Like women, especially women without a husband in this culture 2,000 years ago did not have any legal rights. There were no boots, no straps to pull yourself up by your bootstrap. There was no opportunity, right? So no legal defense, no trust, no ability to, to provide and like utter exposure to the elements. And I don't just mean physical, I mean social elements. Full on exposure. And that is considered by definition, and the same to be fatherless, and by de- or parentless, and by definition, the scripture here is assuming that there is a built-in um, that there is a there is a built-in disadvantage to being an orphan or being a widow, and it says in the scripture enough times that God names these people. Did you know in the Old Testament there's a long tradition of naming these groups because. Uh, Yahweh, the, the God, the one creator God of the heavens and the earth, as he's known in Hebrew, is known as the special protector of these needy ones. There are scriptures that show if you oppress another human being, God is going to be upset, right? But there's enough Old Testament text for us to also know if you oppress an orphan or a widow, God is going to be upset, upset, upset. Because these are, he takes a special interest. He takes a special sense of care in the disadvantaged. So this must mean this, at a bare minimum, Real religion cares. The first one was real religion restrains, if you wanted a word. Real religion restrains. That's what we were doing a second ago. Real religion restrains your words. But now, real religion cares. It must care. And care always gets us going. You know, there's a phrase that's been created called the quartet of the oppressed. Widow, orphan, immigrant, and poor. And God, over and over and over again in the scriptural text, takes care of said people. So just check really quick. Does your worldview, does your, if you count yourself a Christian, a faith, religious person, do you care about widow, orphan, immigrant, and poor? Because if you care, and I'll, by the way, it also says visit, like you will do something. Like it doesn't say just care or feel like a vague, I don't know, affinity in your heart or have a soft heart. It says visit, like do something. Real religion cares. And by the way, if we care, we would do something. Care is always linked to action. Here's a proof. 
Um, one thing that bugs me is my kid is now, she's two years old, so I shouldn't be bothered by much. The bar is low, she's two. But it's very clear that she only talks when she cares enough to talk. She now has selective speech. And so it drives me nuts because like, we'll be trying to talk to, I don't know, anybody, one of you, and I'll be like, Sophia, say hi, say hi. You know, and, and you're all very gracious because you're like, oh, she's just feeling shy. Maybe it's nap time, you know. But I know the truth. She don't care. That's the problem. Like, that's, it's just rude. I got, there's no way around it. That's just what the facts of the situation are. If she cared, she would speak. And you know how I know this happened last week. Literally, we're sitting right back there. We're in a 10 minute conversation with someone. And at the end, we're telling Sophia, say bye, say bye. And it's just like, she's mute, you know? And then, you know, pe people say all the gracious things. But then we go to lunch afterward and we're sitting there. Server comes by, can I get your drink order? And all the adults are talking, you know, you know, water, diet, coke, tea, blah, blah, blah. Server starts to walk off. And then Sophia hollers at her back, catch up. <laughs> we don't holler at adults, you know what I'm saying? Like you just don't. You know why she did that? She cared. She cared about ketchup. If you care, you will do something. It, it is unavoidable. If you don't care, you won't act. And if you do care, you will act. Like, there, it's just foolproof. You know what I mean? If you care, you will do something. So real religion cares enough to do something. This is why um, just, I guess it's been a little over a year, maybe two years ago, we got involved in something called Care Portal. Care Portal, listen to this. This is an incredible little piece of machinery that puts us in touch with humanity, okay? Care Portal is a database where foster families in New York City, there's an enormous foster care system in New York City, foster parents in New York City who have a need for their foster child, any kind of a need, shoes, clothing for school, mattress, iPad for school, you know, kind of a thing, it, the, a request goes to their particular agency where it's vetted and made sure that it's real, you know what I mean? It's not an iPad for uncle so-and-so, it's a legit situation, and, that, and then the agency puts it into Care Portal. And then churches are on the receiving end, like us and like all of you, are in Care Portal. And we can see when a request, and it says, my client is in this situation. It's always hard. It's always hard. Because again, uh, in their affliction, there's always an affliction tied to this of some kind or another. It's always hard. My client has such and such need for such and such reason of this. No, no personal details. We don't get names at that point or anything like that. Can anyone help? And there's churches who basically race each other to raise their hand and say, yes, we can do that. Yes, we can do that. Yes, we can do that. Sometimes it's a gift card you send digitally and you don't see anybody. Sometimes you show up on people's doorsteps and you knock on the door and you hand them something. Or you go in there and you build a crib. You know what I mean? Uh, and to care for people in this way, it is a gift. It is a gift. And all you have to do, we'll make sure at some point today, could we please make sure at some point today that this slide, we have a slide where all you got to do is sign up with a QR code and you just point your phone at that and you can sign up to be on the receiving end of this and you don't have to ask me for permission. You don't have to do anything uh, church-wise. You don't have to be a member of this church. Just don't do anything crazy and tell them we sent you, okay? But, but you don't have to commit to anything. Just go and care. You can do it right now. It's up on the, on the screen right now. If you want to sign up for this, um, just point your phone at the screen right now, and this will send you to a link where you can sign up to be on our response team. It's gonna ask for like first name, last name, email address, very minimal. They're not gonna to advertise to you. What they're gonna do is they're gonna send you when a foster family has a real need so that you can fulfill this verse and not have fake religion, all right? So that you can care for human beings because that's what we want to be about. So um, right there, and it also rotates through uh, at the end uh, of the time, uh, you know, before and after the service. This is in our little auto scroll. So just about every six seconds, you know, a new one will come up. So it'll be there for you as well. We can make sure that you get signed up. Real religion cares, always, always. And then finally, religion that is pure and undefiled before the God the Father is this, we'll let him finish his sentence, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Personal morality. Whenever a relationship with God kicks in, it helps us realize that we've kind of been rolling in the mud. You know what I mean? Like we've kind of been enjoying the wrong thing. And the thing we, we think we've been doing fine dining, but we've been doing dumpster diving, like morally speaking. And it wakes us up and realizes I've got to get unstained from the world here. And by the way, that doesn't mean instant judgmentalism where I join everybody who's not coming with me. And it means that I think I'm better than everybody else now. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean if you want to follow the real God, there are real choices to be made so that you can be unstained 
from the world. And this is a norm, by the way, this is also step by step, I have to say. It's not an instant thing where you become a Christian and then boom, every choice you've ever made uh, is undone and the momentum of your habits is undone. No, there can be some fighting and some back and forth. As you, There is a role for fighting actually against self and sin so that you can walk unstained from the world so that the world doesn't have an excuse to look at us and say, see, there's more of that fake religion. You know what I mean? Whenever a case of like a major, major pastoral hypocrisy breaks, and I'm not talking about um, a testimony I'm to, of the past. I'm talking about like in the present, there's like they preach and then, you know, something else is going on in the midweek in real time. Every time one of those stories breaks, here's what you know intuitively. You might not even say it this way, but here's what you know intuitively. They were not practicing what they preached. Their religion was fake. I'm not trying to say anything about, at, at least at the time and at least in that way. I'm not trying to say anything about eternal life or death. I'm not trying to say I, only God can judge that heart and in terms of what's actually going on there. But I can tell you this, at least lately, they have not heard from the real God because the real God would not peacefully coexist with this kind of a thing, right? In other words, what you see clearly in others, like, oh, they're, 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 they claim the name of Christ, but they're just in the world. Others can see in you, Right? And they can say, oh, well, there's more of that fake religion because this person's just so comfortable in the world. Real religion, in other words, purifies. Real religion, it restrains our words. It cares. If you have a real religion, you just care. You care about your community. It's never been enough for me as a pastor that we, I love what we're seeing now. We're worshiping together. We're, we're having a good Sunday morning. We're getting to open the word together and let the scriptures go through us. I'm doing right now exactly what I love to do. Okay, so I love Sunday morning. But this will never be enough for me. We could fill this theater four times a Sunday and it will never be enough for me if we don't care for the community that we're in, right? You have to care. Real religion cares every time. But more than that, real religion purifies. In other words, real religion doesn't just care about what's going on in the community. It also cares about what's going on in your bedroom. Real religion purifies. It all matters and it comes together. Again, I'm not saying all at once like immediately, but I'm saying definitely. Right? It has a ha- God has a habit. As, we dr- as he draws us closer to him, he brings us naturally further away from the parts of the world that we used to embrace. That's just always how it works. I've walked that road. If you're a Christian, you're walking that road. There was a guy, examples. There was a guy at, at an old church, a previous church that I was working at. Young adult guy, actually was from the Northeast, um, living with his girlfriend, sleeping together. That was totally normalized in, in their relationship. They were not people of faith whatsoever. Um, but then come to church, um, that's where we met. He becomes a Christian, and he says, basically, to honor God and her, um, they were also, they became engaged as well. To honor God and her, I have to move out. Like, I just have to move out. This is not honoring to God. This is not inexpensive. This is going to be an expensive, obedient choice. This is not easy. This is inconvenient. It's countercultural. Nobody at work is going to understand what I'm doing. Why would you pay two rents when you can pay one, blah, blah, blah. But he just is saying, look, I know that this is, for me to remain in this situation, I've just become a Christian, and for me to remain in this situation would be just to remain comfortably in the world when I know good and well God would call me to a different situation, right? So he made the choice. Another guy, same church, um, stole tens of, these has all been shared publicly, by the way, stole tens of thousands of dollars, this is a Christian man, um, from another Christian man at the church, and then God lays it on his heart, you know what, this is a stain from the world. Like you can't, this is just, it literally says in the Bible, don't, thou shalt not steal. You know, this is 101, all right? So just don't, you, we can't be doing this. So anyway, he has like a faith awakening, um, confesses it, pays it back, apologizes, makes amends, and their relationship continues to this day. Didn't even suffer a broken relationship because of the amends that were made. Now that's, a, that's an amazing story, is it not? Because a person just decided, you know what? If my religion's gonna be real, I can't do fake religion anymore. I can't do fake religion. Like, I've got to be unstained from the world. Whatever it takes, I don't care if i got to pay it back with interest. I don't care if i got to pay it back 4X. I just don't care. I want my my God back. Like, I want my faith. I I want peace back. I want my conscience to be clear again. And you just do, when you're there and you want God worse than anything, you will do, it becomes a whatever it takes mentality to keep yourself unstained from the world. Because what good does it do to have a transformative good impact in the city. I mean, what good does it do if we can even just 
love so many foster families that the foster system itself disappears because we're taking care of kids so well, if then we turn around and we're a bunch of hip, uh, hypocrites in our personal lives. Like what, what, everybody would know, well, they did some good in the community, but religion was fake. You know what I mean? It's just not going to work. I remember when I was in college and I had had uh, a really rough set of teenage years and made a lot of bad choices. And one of the things left over from that was a terrible pornography addiction, absolute addiction, had no self-control whatsoever. And I start to realize, okay, I'm a Christian man now. I'm you know, 20 years old or so at this point, And I've been a Christian for a couple of years. And this part of my life just has not changed. And so I am living in hypocrisy. And it seems like every time my bedroom door closes, I'm irresponsible and untrustworthy. What can I do? And I thought, well, the, the main thing I need to do is worship God more and sin less. But since that is proven to be a challenge, I'll just remove the bedroom door. So I lived my senior year of college without a bedroom door. And I just literally took it off the hinges. And um, you know what? It, it just has a way of uh, removing your privacy and your temptation. That's all I can tell you, okay? Because there's nowhere to go, okay? So, uh, and that's, that, that's how I lived. Is, and, and my roommates knew. I mean, I wasn't even trying to hide it. So is it embarrassing? Um, only if you're ashamed of God and the holiness he calls you to. That's what I would say. Like, you've got to just decide. Do you want to be stained by the world and call it okay? Or do you want to do whatever it takes so you can be unstained by the world? All right? So this is, just, this is part of what real religion always does. Now, I'm not saying... Um, it's going to look that way, okay? Not everybody in this room is a Christian cohabitating with and sleeping with a girlfriend or fiance or boyfriend or fiance. I'm not saying, not every person in this room is addicted to pornography and needs to remove their bedroom door, so don't, you know, it's not one size fits all here. Not every person in this room has stolen $100,000, at least I hope not, all right? So listen, it, it, wherever you're at, you're just going to have to let God lead you as to what it looks like. But every, for all of us, if you claim the name of Christ for the sake of his reputation, let us try to keep ourselves unstained from the world. You know, the beginning of the end of our holiness is when stains from the world just become normalized, you know? I have to say about stains, though, the power is when, and when they, get, they get removed. It feels so good when grace gives you a do-over and a stain is removed, and that's what Jesus Christ does, is removes the stains of the world, okay? The only reason I can speak so freely of my own failings and others is because they don't stain my heart anymore. My conscience is not dinged up up here like, ooh, I don't know if I can mention that because I'm feeling bad about it up here. Jesus has removed the stain from my conscience and from my lived habits and experiences, right? And that's what, it, it, it just feels, there's power in seeing a stain come out. You know, I had said a few, a few months ago, we had really bad roof damage, um, you know, over the last like year, basically, it's been a long year. If you know the crime, if you've been here at all and dipped in on that particular Sunday, I've updated you all on the Chronicle. That is my roof. Well, um, it finally got so bad that I'm like, I'm going up there. I don't know anything about roofs, but what can it hurt? I'll pray. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm going on the roof. So I get on the roof and I get to know my roofer really well. Nobody wants to know a roofer as well as I know my roofer. All right. I know these guys. All right. That we become friends. No lie. I gave them a gift card because I, they did so good at the end. So um, anyway, I'm up there and like I'm in my coat because it's freezing like 20 something degrees. So I'm in like my, my, my nice coat, you know, it's supposed to keep me warm when it's 20 degrees outside. So and we're, we've got this like white paste that, you know, is supposed to stay on roofs while it rains i.e. it's not going anywhere. And I like rolled in it, you know, and so I've got like my elbow here and I'm like, oh, I just ruined this coat. And it's, when you realize a stain is there, it always makes you panic. You're like, oh, I've ruined something. That happens to our hearts and to our conscience. When we do something wrong that we know is wrong and once we realize it and we stop calling it okay, all of a sudden our conscience awakes and we go, oh no, I've ruined something. And we panic. Like, that's what it always feels like. You, you know, you spill, you, you spill um, wine or juice um, on the carpet, and you just go, oh, no, I've ruined something. That's what we do when we realize we've made a morally bad choice. What the gospel does is actually forgive real sin. This roofer, he goes, hey, you got to go downstairs. He, like, knew exactly what to do. He, like, makes eye contact with me. And I'm like, tell me, I need a pastor right now. What do I need to do? He says, go downstairs, go to your sink, um, get the Dawn dishwashing soap that he had seen and washed his hands with, and you use a scrub. And it doesn't matter if it gets wet. You just soap, scrub, like with the toughest sponge you got, because it's a tough-looking coat. It's not going to, you know, it's got a tough edge to it, so just scrub. It, w it worked perfectly, <laughs> okay? And the coat was revived. Listen, whenever your moral story is compromised and there's a stain on your heart, you need someone who knows what they're doing to tell you to go to Christ whose cross pays for all sin so that you can feel free, be free, and then, this to this point, Stay free, because real religion purifies. There's no way you can get free, be free, feel free, and then be like, I don't like freedom anymore. I'll just keep living over here, doing whatever. Like, to stay free, real religion must purify. That's what it does. Let's summarize this message by saying this, and we go back to worship. If our faith, this is just my summary. This is not the Bible. This is my summary. If our faith makes our words less controlled, 
our distressed neighbors less cared for and our moral lives identical to our surroundings, the world will say no thanks and so will God. There is just no, there, no, and by the way, so will you because you don't want to live with a useless religion either. Like if you're living in hypocrisy, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to get out of the hypocrisy or you're going to get out of the church. Like just give it time. It's one of those two things because the human heart cannot stand the personality fracture of living two lives, at least unless you've got bigger issues, okay? So you, it is not normal for a healthy human heart to be able to tolerate two life living. That is not possible. So even you will reject fake religion eventually. People are natural. This is, but, but, but let's imagine on the upside. What would it be like if this was a place where people's words were wise instead of venti and this was a community where people cared about more than this community itself more than this church was about more than just itself we've said before no healthy church has self-consciousness at its heart right we're here for the community and what if this was a place where we as best we were able still going to be imperfect on this side of eternity i got that but what if on this on this side of eternity while we battle sin we battle hard and we battle well And we say, I want to be unstained from the world. In other words, we're doing what James is telling us to do. What will happen is people will have an excuse to walk by and they'll say, I don't know if it's real to me, but it's real to them. I don't know if I can worship yet. I don't know if I can affiliate, belong. I don't know. I just, there's a lot I don't know, but I can say this. Whatever I'm seeing is genuine. You know, even if someone is not a Christian and has no Christian like rubric in their head whatsoever, when they see someone, you heard the suspicion in the Instagram comments, okay? I can't, I can't type back fast enough. And even if I typed well enough, I can't convince anybody. That's not the way the internet works, right? But I can tell you this, we won't win everybody. But if we are restrained with our words at the appropriate time, and you're going to get your chances, it's the big politics year, you're going to get your chances, okay? But if you can, to restrain your words. Um, if you can restrain our, your words and you can care for this community, particularly those who are at a disadvantage, and um, you, you're in your personal life just constantly striving by the power of grace to be purified, that is attention getting stuff. That is the kind of things that showcases genuineness, sincerity, and it shows that this is not a fake religion. I just want to tell you one last thing. Fake religion is too much upkeep. When something is fake, it's fragile and it's high maintenance and it's exhausting and you can't rest. You only want something real. I'll give you an illustration. My front four teeth are fake, okay? They're veneers, okay? Somebody just looked up like, what? So they're fake. There was a decision back in high school to like, there's like a gap in my front teeth. Do you push them together with braces? That's what we should have done. Um, Or it was, you can just shave your real teeth down until they're like stumps, you look like Shrek. And then they put fake teeth. I'm not making fun of anybody's grill. And then, you, and then they put fake teeth, porcelain, literal caps on top of your front four. That's what veneers are. Okay, so I have, these are fake, and if I lose one, it's pretty gnarly. You know what I mean? It looks bad. It um, looks like I lost a fight or something, and there's like a tooth missing is what it appears. Okay, all of the, they're fake, and they're high maintenance and fragile, and they bother me. Every one of them has broken more than once, and the dentists don't sell you that. They sell you, oh, they're tough. They're just like your real teeth. No, they're not. Your real teeth are like your real teeth. Don't put fake teeth in your mouth. Um, Maybe you've had a better experience than me, but it just didn't work. It's high maintenance. I've literally, I've had them come out while eating, okay? Um, I was at a concert once in college. Not sure it was the right place. Uh, And, you know, the guy's like, put your hands up. And, like, the guy next to me puts his hands up, catches me under the chin. Now one of them's gone. It's a pain. Now to this day, I get made fun of by, like, literally made fun of by my grandfather. We're at the barbecue, and the corn on the cob comes out, and I'm like, knife off the side. I won't bite it, okay? And he makes fun of me and I don't care, okay? Because my teeth are fake and they're fragile. Don't sign up for fake and fragile. Listen, if your Christian faith is some imitation thing you do for your mom, it's just too much up, it's too high maintenance. It's not real. It's not, it also is not tough. It cannot survive a single impact. One thing goes wrong in your life, you're going to lose it. There's no resilience in anything fake. There's no joy in anything fake. There's no rest in anything fake. Sign up for the real thing. Right? And James has shown us, James inspired by the Spirit of God to write these holy scriptures has shown us um, what it means to have a real response. Let's pursue it together and let's continue to sing and bring our hearts to God. Father, we know your love is real. We know your care is real. Your forgiveness is real. All that you are is real. There's, no, uh, there's nothing hidden in you, uh, nothing unpredictable in you, nothing shaming in you. Um, you're just open invitation your free forgiveness, your love and grace in Christ. 
Lord, I pray that this community that is forming at Mission City with all of its linguistic and racial and geographic and cultural backgrounds, that you would form a people with a singular desire to practice real religion. Lord, help us know and progress in the areas where we need to know and progress, that we need progress. Lord, show us where one word would do better than 10 and where 10 would do better than 100 and where zero would do better than any of them. Lord, show us how to care and not just care, but to act, to do the deeds of caring for orphans and widows in this city you've placed us in. Lord, show us how you would purify us. Lord, we know you're... Your purifying power actually intimidates us because we know that we are impure. Lord, remind us that the cross is all we need to know that we are welcome as we are and forgiven as we are. Lord, we are grateful for your your sanctifying and your calling grace so that we can walk with you as one together, even as you are one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.